this is, this is, this is. Surprise! Welcome to episode 470. It's a Saturday and it's a special release day. Normally we release these podcasts on Mondays. So this Monday you're not going to get a podcast, but you'll just have an extra couple days of this podcast. The reason why, one, big reason why I wanted to put this out on Saturday is because my guest Jeff Suffering and his band 90 Pound Wuss are playing their first show in one week that this comes out. So depending on when you're listening to, that may not be the case. But they're playing a show in my hometown, Bremerton, Washington, and the show's at Redwood Theater, Tracyton Theater, whatever you want to call it, Saturday, July 29th. That's one week from this special podcast release. Even if you're in Portland, uh, make the drive, because this is their first show in 23 years, and they've been practicing. You're going to hear all about it. I mean, we talk all about that. We talk about... Uh, Furnace Fest, because 90 Pound Wuss is also playing Furnace Fest. Furnace Fest is on a Friday, and that's in September. September 22nd, uh, Friday, and MXPX happens to be playing that night as well. So MXPX, Hatebreed, Anne Berlin, Reliant K, 90 Pound Wuss is going to be insane. So real quick, somewhere in the podcast, I might have said that the show for Furnace Fest was September 21, 21st. No, 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 no. I, I was not thinking. I didn't have it in front of me. It's September 22nd. All right, so that's why I want to do this Saturday episode. Oh, there's one more reason. One more reason to do Saturday is because yesterday was an amazing day for MXPX and MXPX fans. We put on sale the pre-order for our new album, MXPX, Find a Way Home. And we're really proud of this new record, and we've been teasing it with a couple songs throughout the week last week. And this is the cover, if you haven't already seen it. Um, Let me take the blur off this. Look at that, baby. There you go. There's the cover. There's the back cover. Uh, Insert lyrics, artwork, credits, things like that. Um, You know, vinyl, you've you've seen the vinyl a little bit by now. Uh, if you haven't, please go check out MXPX and all our socials, whatever you whatever you follow along on social media-wise. Go find MXPX on there. So anyway, excited. The pre-order is out. It's on sale at MXPX.com. MXPX, new song. We, we put out a new song yesterday. Stay up all night. This song's about, it's about heartbreak, really. It's about making mistakes over and over and, and letting down the ones you love and feeling like you can't ever get things right. But... You can make that choice to keep trying to get it right. And and that's what I do daily in my life is just I screw up, I screw up, I screw up. I try to get it right. So everybody's got their own story. And uh, this song tells a little bit of mine. It's called Stay Up All Night. If you haven't already listened to it, please go add it to all of your music libraries, Spotify, Apple Music, you know, Amazon Music, Google, whatever it is you, you listen on. I would love for you to, to check out the song. Um, if you haven't already seen the clips that we've put out from other songs, please go, go look at the MXPX socials. You know, the record comes out August 25th. And if you pre-order, you know, today or soon, uh, we'll have your order, you know, to you right around the time the record comes out. Let's get to my guest, Jeff Suffering. We talk about 90 Pound Wuss and, you know, sort of what happened and, and why, why they didn't play for so long um <clears throat> it all this stuff sort of sort of comes out just because jeff keeps talking and he keeps talking and i barely really even have to prompt him and, and ask i have a lot of questions believe me but like i didn't really have to ask a lot of questions we just talked about it and had a, a great conversation so uh let's just get right into it and jeff hey more power to him i love my friends and uh jeff i am proud to call you a friend Here's Jeff suffering. Make sure you guys check out 90 Pound Wuss, and you'll you'll understand why when you listen to the episode. Do you remember the first time we met? The first time we met... Was it in Port Townsend? Port Townsend. Port Townsend, at that show. Yeah, like a community center show. Now, in my memory, you guys promoted that show. You put that on, you rented the, the community hall. Yes, we did, but I was... And I think I was in a band that played called This Suffering. And it wasn't I don't even think 90 it was 90 Pound Wuss yet. I think it was, Whoa. but I think Hamelberger still put it on. Oh, it was Hamelberger. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, nice. I don't think it was a uh, ninety pound wuss. I just remember I was so excited when we played that show because there was people moshing. There was a pit like the whole time. Oh yeah, the Olympic Peninsula, man. Yeah. I mean, just like your shows out here, probably. They were kind of crazy when we would play those halls and stuff, and pretty much from here, from <laughs> basically anywhere west of Seattle, all the shows were always crazy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It was like tons of like underage drinking, <laughs> like mayhem. It was just nuts. Yeah, so yeah. much fun. I don't remember the. Under- I mean, I guess there was underage drinking, but I was underage at the time, so I didn't think of it like that. I didn't think of it like a parent, like oh, there's underage drinking. I just thought, hey, there's drinking, cool. Well, yeah, I didn't think of it that way either, but looking back, it was yeah. like, yeah, none of them. There were some punk rockers who would, you know, buy beer for everybody and then make yeah. you give them 10 bucks or something if you got three beers or something. Yeah. <laughs> we we weren't, you know, we weren't a beer drinking, you know, we were just kids back yeah. then and we didn't drink beer until, I mean, I, did, I definitely drank a few beers underage, but before the band even, but looking back on the band, like, I feel like I'm thankful that we weren't into drinking yet. Because once we were, it was like, okay, things shifted. You know? Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> Life changes a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and then you have to rebalance yourself again later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do tell, do tell. Yeah. So it's great to have you here. Um, thanks for being on Jeff Suffering. Yeah. Dude, hey. we, we go way back, and it's been a while. So we're going to yeah. have to catch up a little bit. Um, but we can talk about anything and everything. Sounds good. Talk about. Like I said, I'm an open book, so whatever. Where do you want to start? I mean, let's just go back to, like, when we first met, you know, that show. I have little memories from that show. Obviously, the, the mosh pit being one of the coolest things. And there's there's photos from the show. I don't know if there's video. But did Plank Guy play, or was it, I think, Crux? Maybe it Don't Know? Crux or Don't Know. Yeah. But I don't think Plank Guy... It, Plank Guy wasn't around back in those days. They yeah. were They were, like, after we were signed and, like... We were mixing with other tooth and nail bands, and they maybe they showed up, but that was probably another show out there that maybe maybe we played two shows because I remember there was a Plank Eye show too, but yeah, I think it was probably Crux and Down Now or something. Yeah, so you guys used to put on your. I think another reason why we were such good friends back then is MXPH started out just promoting our own shows, and same with you, John yeah. Himmelberger. Ber- sorry, Himmelberger. Himmelberger, yeah, that right. <laughs> Don't want to gloss over that. But um, just the, the working class blue collar mentality of not only are we artists, we're doing this thing, but we're getting our hands dirty and we're making this happen all together. Yeah. And, and getting to meet you guys and see somebody else that was doing similar things to us. I didn't think of it like that at the time. I'm thinking about that now that I kind of know, oh, similar minds, similar types of things, you know, kind of go together. But um it just kind of clicked for us, you know, just, you know, people that, people that we can feel comfortable around. You guys were always that. Except for the time Thanks, you pooped man. in a cup. Uh, yeah, that was weird. <laughs> that was, my butt was hanging out of the uh, passenger of the van. It was pooped in a cup on the road. <laughs> That's it's good. classic. We can talk about pooping in a cup. You know, you hang your butt out of the window going down the freeway and you, you know, try not to fall out the window and poop in a cup. That's right. What it's was really weird what? and wrong? <laughs> that was the one of the worst things I think I've ever. That's not that bad done. if you think about it. There's no, way worse things you I can know, do. I know, but I don't like the bad decisions I make are always stupid. Like, that. <laughs> you know, like I remember one time, I think I, I was naked at Hiawatha House. We were drunk. I probably drank urine. That happened. Dumped it on myself and ran down the street out of from a dare. And the yes. cops were right there. And it was still daylight <laughs> out. And here comes this naked person running down the street. And I remember John and Doug and everybody's laughing. And all of a sudden, hey, it's too early for that. Like the cop like literally said that out of the thing. So I just turned around and ran back. <laughs> Say no more. It was pretty funny. So usually my bad decisions are just... Uh, dumb pranks. Yeah, that yeah. Most of the time, I'm egged on and dared to do. I don't really do that so much anymore in my old age. Was there a lot? Is it? I mean, just hearing you talk about drinking pee reminds me of a lot of times when I was younger. And yes, I've drank pee before. I've drank my own. I've drank others. Yes. Um, it's, it's always a, it's on a, a dare. It's a good dare. It's always on a dare or fifty or hundred dollars. Yep. Now, what's your price now? 
<laughs> uh, my price to drink somebody else's urine would probably be at least a couple hundred bucks. At least. Yeah, at least at a least. couple hundred bucks. My own, eh. hundred bucks. I'd probably do it for a hundred bucks. A hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on the day. Most days I'd say no, no way. Yeah, most days I'd say But no. every now and again, you're just like... Pfft. I'm already drinking piss. What are you doing? What a, well, <laughs> I'm drinking it for free. Beer, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, man, it's great Great to have you here. Great to have you in, at the studio. It's a mess in here. But, uh, man, I'm so excited that 90 Pound Wuss is coming back. You're, you're back. I mean, I've seen you yep. online. So you're back. Yep. You're talking. You're riling up. You're, you're getting people excited. Um, you're coming to Bremerton. Playing a show in Bremerton at it's actually this podcast is going to come out basically the week before. So oh cool. So uh, you're, this Saturday, uh, July twenty eighth. July twenty ninth. Yes. 29th. July twenty ninth, Saturday. Twenty ninth. Uh, um, the Tracy Ten Theater, which has a they do some shows at in the yep. Red Room as they call it, or the Redwood Room or something. Redwood Room. Yeah. yeah. That that used to be a well, it is a theater still, but um, and it looks like a theater when you walk in there's arcade games everything it's cool it's got a a little bar but um i've gone to shows there a bunch of shows um urethane teenage bottle rocket so like actual touring punk bands have come through and played and there's a bunch more shows that have happened so it's it's rad that you're playing bremerton yeah it'd be cool i think it's perfect um you know i i was weary about um so basically we got asked to play furnace fest this year of course of and, course and that's that's why this whole thing got sparked it actually happened at an unwed sailor concert in seattle at um the uh chop suey so mm-hmm. jonathan ford from roadside monument and mr bishop's fist and all that stuff back in the day he his band is unwed sailor and it's mm-hmm. like an instrumental um whatever they call it post rock or whatever um band and they he's been doing that ever since he left roadside that band so they have tons of releases but he was touring and roadside did furnace fest last year and so i you know they did one seattle show and warm-up was there and um ran into jonathan he said unwed sailor was coming by we should hook up when he comes on tour so i went to the show he's like totally praising me like being really cool about like you should really be making music jeff you've always been so creative and all this stuff and i had these excuses for years why i wasn't doing it you know a lot of it was i have other responsibilities with my family and some of it was i mean literally a big one and it's it's real and kind of hard was um after being involved in a church cult for so many years of my life i uh, um had some ptsd around creativity sure and i have learned uh that there's some similar ties that happen with um like ex- like extreme sexual abuse and stuff over my therapies and stuff that happens where you lose some uh um part of your uh creative element that that you were tied to and um that that was there before and something has to happen in order for you to sort of get that back and I didn't know that mm. so it was like a part of me was dead yeah and um this part that was in integral part of who I am as a, as a person, um, had just kind of died and I, I didn't realize I even needed it in my life. You didn't even realize it. Yeah. And I, I just like, part of me was like, nah, it sounds like too much of a pain in the ass to like organize people and do all this stuff, which I do every day for work. I work construction and I project manage, uh, you know, bathroom remodels and kitchen remodels and stuff, Mm -hmm. mostly smaller residential things and, and a lot of flooring, um, stuff so i'm organizing subs i'm organizing ordering like that's my life right so Mm -hmm. not a not a big deal to deal with logistics and um for some reason it was just this thing that sounded like such a pain in the ass and so i was giving jonathan these excuses and he's like man it's just good for your soul like be good for you you're really great at it and he said what about 90 pound wuss and i'm like well spaulding's you know he, he passed away and he's like, isn't there somebody who could play his parts? And we were like brainstorming and thought of some people or whatever. And then a friend of ours from back in the day, I don't know if you remember him. His name was Jonathan Simonson, really big guy. Um, Sounds familiar. Anyways, he was yeah. around back in those days when 90 pound was, was first starting and you guys were around and stuff. 
Um, he was in a band before 90 Pound was with John Himmelberger, and he passed away. And I went to his funeral, and Marty and John Himmelberger were there. And uh, so it was like Mike Gizzy from Wow Nito Frank Mike, back yeah, in the day. Mike, yeah, yeah, so he was there too and some other people. And I had mentioned that Jonathan was talking about doing this thing. Oh, and Jonathan at that concert said, well, you know what? I'm going to bug the guys at, at Furnace Fest since I'm friends with them and see if they'll call you. I'll give them your number and see if they'll call you. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, right, nothing will happen. Sure. So I mentioned it to Marty and Himmelberger and said, hey, would you be interested in doing this if they call? I don't know if they will. Sure enough, a week later, um, <laughs> I get a phone call, and uh, we just started talking about it. It makes sense. Um, everybody wanted to do it, and then um, we were like, who's going to play bass? We had, you know, so many. We knew Dale was back up here. You know, Giles and I had reconciled from years ago. Like, he actually co- reached out to me and said, hey, man, I'm really sorry for just leaving and not talking to you yeah. guys. And that was really shitty of me. It, like, it was awesome, man. Like, okay. And we even worked on a construction project. I don't know where he is now, maybe in Portland or something, but he was in Seattle for a while. So um, we were brainstorming who could play it's bass and, from the past, and, yeah. and all these different people. Yeah, I mean, both both the guys in the cooties that weren't in yeah, the yeah, right. bass of 90 pound was at some point. <laughs> and then, you know, even like Gunner, the original bass player, like, should we even have him? Like, there was like... Yeah. But we've been so far estranged, and he kind of hermited himself, um, as far as we know. So we had no idea um, where where these people were at. But then it made sense. Like, Marty's brother-in-law lives in Port Angeles and um, played bass in this band when Spalding was in it. Um, his name's Matt, uh, and he was in uh, uh, Matt Bailey. He was in some, you know, a band with Mark Solomon, that uh, Outer Circle band. He played mm-hmm. bass in that band, and... Um, he was in 90 Pound Wuss, did one tour with us down the West Coast. So that was me, Marty, um, Ham, or uh, sorry, Spalding, and Matt Bailey. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he was in the band for maybe around a year. And then I was like, we should probably just have Matt do it. And so he was into it, and that solidified the lineup. But the one thing I was always worried about was, like, uh, we never were – uh, a great live band we were always a spectacle like it was always like felt like everything was going to fall apart but there was a lot of energy and and so at the time that was like people enjoyed that but i was like we're older i want to be tight and i want to be <laughs> yeah. tight and sound good and spalding did some stuff on the last record uh shorthand operation that that's one of my favorite records i've ever been a part of and still i think it holds up um the recording's good. The songs, I think, are good. Anyway, he did some really interesting stuff on guitar, and a lot of it were, was, like, some overdubs and stuff that we could never do live. Mm-hmm. So I was, tr- since day one, basically saying, we should have another guitar player. And um, there was a, th- a few people that came to mind that are good friends, and one of them is the one we ended up getting. His name's Colin, Colin Day, and he um, is a good friend of ours. Well, mine originally. Now he... He's good friends with the other guys in the yeah. band. But um, what's ended up happening with two guitar <clears throat> players, we sacrificed some of the sparseness on some of the songs that made them interesting to add in some newer elements. And it feels like it's really, in a lot of ways, a, a newer band. We can do all the things that were tricky that Spalding did because he's a weird, unique guitar player that kind of did his own things. And we can use... Those songs from Shorthand Operation, I think, sound better than they've ever sounded, period. Just hands down better. We got the tempos right on all the stuff. Stuff from the second record, Where Meager Die, that I, you know, my voice was really harsh on that record. I'm literally too old and can't do that anymore. So they're more melodic, and I think that there's some elements that um, uh, sound a lot better, and they're just tighter. And so... There's a thickerness to some of those songs, too, because some of those songs are really sparse when it's just guitar single picking mm-hmm. and the bass doing chords and, and, and me yelling or whatever. They're, they get pretty sparse, but we've been able to still have those dynamics, but we've changed a few things so that they get heavy, like heavier than we've probably ever been as a band with two guitar players. It, it's easier to do. So there's elements that are, I think are... Um, 
new to this version around and like the songs from the first record we're playing since we have two guitar players and a lot of those parts are really simple we actually have you know between me singing and other things there's a second guitar part that will be more melodic Mm -hmm. and like to me it changes the dynamic of the song it makes it fresh it feels um it feels really vibrant and dynamic and it's it's been this good healing process for me and my religious trauma to sort of like have this creative outlet again yeah it's like suddenly my capacity and bandwidth in normal life and everything has just like amped up like i feel like oh i can actually make shit happen again and and get stuff done whereas before it was like i just want to go to work and come home and do nothing for like a decade my life has been that and um (laughs) it was really hard to get anything done so it's it's nice to like yeah suddenly it's like, go, 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 go. And I'm on the move again. And it feels vibrant. It feels new. It feels life giving. It feels like a part of me is, is resurrected from the dead, basically like just part of me. That's just, you know what, this is who I am and who I was made to be. And I Mm. sacrificed it for, um, religion. Um, and it feels nice to have so, that weight off my yeah. neck and gone. I don't want to be in the interview guy because, like, you're, you're you're putting out all these like nuggets of like, okay, I grew up in a you know not grew up, but like I went through this church cult thing, and then like I lost my creativity. Half of me died. Like, this is Oprah material. Here, oh, totally, you know? yeah, I know. But but it's your life. It's yeah. real. Yep. Like people, you know, loved ones have passed. Like, I don't know where you want to go with it, but I do like not having really any context to, to yep. what you were talking about with the church thing. Yep. But I do know it's like the Mars Hill thing, right? Yeah, we, we were, but Mars Hills definitely, I believe it was a religious cult. Oh. And, um, looking back, a lot of people that went there, you know, that are friends and stuff don't think that way, but I yeah. do. Like, I believe that the way that they sort of, um, a, a kind of narcissistic leader, like promulgated himself. And I feel really duped and used by that guy. But fortunately, um, you know, I've gone through therapy for a number of years and like really <laughs> dealt with yeah. some of those things. And I'm really comfortable with, you know, all the parts of my life. I'm actually super comfortable with all the like nuances and weird stuff. Like I'm an open book and I'm totally free. People can learn from it. They can hate me for it. They can do whatever. And I don't really, really yeah. care anymore. I get that from you. Like yeah. as soon as you walked in the door today, we were talking about like kind of intimate stuff right away. Yeah, totally. And you're just like, yeah, this, this and that, you know, and not everybody's that open. So like yeah. whatever you're doing, it seems to be working, right? Like, yeah. you know, you, you, you seem happy. Um, you're open, you're creating things. Like I'm excited to see 90 pound wuss, but I'm not just that, but I'm just excited to see my friends that I haven't seen in a while. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like it's cool, you know, for somebody like me, that's sort of, you know, I've got a lot of friends from different decades and, and all that, but like I spend a lot of my time alone. You know, just doing work, just doing this and that or whatever. So it is kind of nice to see an old friend that, that you know, has been through a lot. See you smiling, see you nice. talking with a lot of vigor about the, you know, the people that you've gathered and, and the fact that, you know, you can do this. You can you can organize, you can make things happen and and you can do so much more than you even realize. So it's it's awesome to see. I love that. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. it's it's. What I never connected to back in the day, I think that there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, I, I could have even been like uh, mentally ill in some perspectives. <laughs> you know, there, there's like a lot of like the 90 pound was material uh, that wasn't really most of the religious stuff was on the first record. But but there w- was other things. And we sang a lot about politics and we sang a lot like I'm realizing we sing a lot about like the aspects of uh the Christian uh, right that we didn't even like when we were involved with religion, which, you know, has really manifest itself in negative ways in today's culture and society with, you know, pretty much most of the right wing conservative evangelicals tend to be, in my opinion, fascists. And they're really trying to limit other people's uh, control over their own bodies, over their um, sexual identity, over their gender identity, over stuff that is none of their business. And so it's interesting to look back and see, you know, we had songs like legalism, we had songs like heresy and all these things where I'm like literally like demonizing and calling um, out 
religious dogma and bigotry. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's totally, that's totally fucking 90 pound wuss, man. Like I can still do that with a clear conscience. And like, um, most of those songs are definitely like we're doing legalism. We're doing shedding blood, which is more like, you know, the metaphors of the, the, the good things about the Christ figure in the Bible or whatever. So there, there's some cool stuff that I'm totally okay with. And there's some stuff that I've changed that I'm not okay with that are, end up making things more relevant to today. But, um, the, uh, most part is when, when I was, when I was younger, I was focused more on like a lot of the satire and negative, you know, stuff more like uh, dead Kennedys, but you know, th there's a lot of sarcasm and there's a lot of darkness in that music mm -hmm. and subhumans and stuff like that really influenced me a lot more than, um, you know, say like, like, uh, you know, some more of the positive lyrics that were coming out at that time or more of the just mon mundane stuff and like pop punk, you know, I mean, Rancid and, and Green Day, uh, great songwriters, great songs, but because the the stuff, you know, I was in a goth and industrial too and all yeah. that stuff, so I had this uh, thing that would just gravitate to this darkness. Yeah. And so a lot of it would be, a lot of the songs were a little bit negative and it grew that way more and more as we... You know, and I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I mean, this is like home of, I mean, fucking Nirvana. Like, right? Like, yeah. that, that stuff's pretty, like, you listen to it now and you're like, oh, shit, that's pretty heavy. Yeah. And so I think we gravitated. At first, it was more or less, that first record, we were having, like, Bible studies and hanging out together. And then we'd play music. <laughs> so that's why a lot of the songs had religious themes. Right. And then later, as we developed, it was, like, more of my poetry and thoughts about life and whatever. And then the subject matters were more internal and that's also probably why I can speak about that stuff because I've been doing it through songs for so long. Mm -hmm. And then when I did, you know, Rafted and Monkeys, it went back to sarcasm and, and being ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Suffering in the Hideous Thieves was once again more like internal and sort of like me, you know, doing uh, processing things and ideas and more self-reflective and also a lot of metaphor and allegory around storytelling about other people. Now... Like after all those years of like so much darkness and I feel so well like healed and like divor divorced from like religious dogma and institutions and all that stuff. I mm -hmm. feel like what I really want to do, I don't know if it'll be 90 pound wuss or something else, but what I really want to do is like uh, I want to learn how to write like freaking like love songs and songs that are like like happy and like like. <laughs> Positive, I was not expecting know? love songs. Well, like positive stuff too. <laughs> I, I think yeah, that, positive. All, yeah, yeah, like 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 totally like the bad brains. You know, like yeah. a positive mental attitude yeah. is like like I'm loving it right now when it's when it's the, that PMA shit. Like yeah, man, and there's so much good hate energy. Breed. Go, oh, hate breeds phenomenal with that. I mean, yes. Jamie Josta. Like you listen to that music, but those lyrics. It's like MXPX, but yeah. With like hardcore, <laughs> dude, it's so like, rad. Yeah, yeah, like it's you great. can do better. You can you can be good. Deal with the demons in your mind. You yeah, know, like it's yeah. almost like too cliche. Like it's like so like basic all the lyrics. But it's which so is but positive. it's but but there's nothing yeah negative yeah. you can say about it except for that it's like so basic you can understand if you read those lyrics you know what he's trying to tell you. I mean, I th <clears throat> I didn't back in the day. I think hate breed was a little bit too metal for me. Now I really don't. Care. I like everything, but the um, the best thing about them is reading their lyrics. You're always like, "Oh, dude, this guy's punk as fuck, man. He's so PMA. Like, this is good yeah. shit." And you know, he he's total DIY, dude. I'm actually stoked on that bill. That is like, yes, furnace fest. Yeah, so Friday bad. night. You guys are going to yep. be playing that day yep. in the afternoon, probably. Or? Probably. I think I'm getting enough time. And yet, then, but. well, we have Reliant K, mm -hmm. Amber Lynn, Hate Breed, and then MXPX to close it out. First night of fri uh, Friday, Friday, first night. night of Furnace Fest. Um, that's the 21st, September 21st. Yeah, I believe yeah. so, yeah. Yep. Um, so, I'm looking forward to that. Like, I, I haven't been to Furnace Fest yet, but just the lineup itself, like every single one of those bands I love, and and you were the first one that sort of got me hooked into Furnace Fest. Yay. It's like when, when I heard you guys were playing, that actually helped us decide, okay, we'll play, because it... You know, and, and even though yes. you weren't originally on the same day and they wanted to move you or whatever. Yep. I'm so glad they did um, because I was just like, 
oh, 90 pound wuss is playing? Well, we definitely should probably do this thing. <laughs> yeah, they call, they reached out and said, hey, can we change your day? Because it looks like MXPX is going to play, and we'd like it if you guys could play the same day. And I'm like, yeah, put us as close as you feel comfortable to them. <laughs> yes. Wh- whatever that, that is. I said, I would love it if we could play right before them, but I realize that's probably not going to happen. So just <laughs> the same day and, like, <laughs> whatever that works, it'll be like old school time. So, yeah, that's that's awesome. That's great to hear, man. I'm so glad. You guys are going to be there. It's so cool, man. Do a stage dive during Hate Breed before oh, I say. Oh, yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> there, there, there's but so you, many new, like, hardcore bands, too, that are playing yeah. there that I love. I, I've seen Scal. I'm going to see Gel. I've seen Zulu open for Off, man. Like, uh, th- okay. those are my three, like, favorite new hardcore, like, uh, punk bands. Okay. Like, those three, they're great. I don't I'll know. Have to check them heard, out. I haven't heard them. Gel's no. from New York. Mid Tempo, like, they're awesome. And Zulu's from southern california and i think scal is too both they're, they're all three of those bands like i listen to them all the time they're like my new favorite punk bands and then there's this math rock band this math core band playing called the callus dale boys that i think are phenomenal i just went and saw them recently and i got to talk to them a little bit it was they were really nice but they're playing i think on saturday and um you know, I, I Zayo toured recently and i saw saw Zayo again and they're playing nice so yes, it's like it was Zayo. so cool catching up with all these these people, man, it's awesome. Yeah, I think honestly, like that's probably what excites me the most is is not only just the lineup of Furnace Fest, but just getting to see so many bands that that I haven't seen in so many years. Um, Reliant K, it's been like since two thousand five since wow. we toured with them, um, and Amber Lynn. I mean, last time I saw them, they were break, they were like done. They're like, this is our last tour. They asked me to come out and do some acoustic stuff. MXPX wasn't touring at the time, you know, just had a little time. And I was like, okay, since it's their last tour, <laughs> I'll do it. I'll nice. do it. And almost died on that tour and, you know, whatever, wow. but like made it through. And then I'm like, all right, they're going to get back together within five years. And sure enough, they did. did and I'm glad they did. I'm glad that Amberlynn is playing that show. I love those guys. Yeah, that's cool. Did yeah. you... Uh, so did you open for them on that tour as Mike Herrera or just as Mike Herrera? Set no, I, I was opening for them okay, as Mike, rad, Mike Herrera. Dude, I and didn't it was, know you did that. I, yeah, yeah. I, can, I don't nice. remember if there was any other bands on the actual bill. I think it was just me opening and then they went on. Um, I could be wrong, but That's pretty cool. that shows how my brain works. I can only remember myself in the headline. <laughs> And usually the it's that uh, usually I am the headliner so it's, but uh yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome but uh no I that was a fun tour but definitely almost died um but Furnace Fest though is going to be the opposite of that I almost died due to snow like heavy snowstorm buried but um this is going to be pretty hot down, yeah, this time we're going to die because Birmingham. we're going to get dehydrated <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm a little nervous I'm like <laughs> <laughs> yeah no one's ever died at furnace fest am i yeah. right i hope not statistically heard, there yeah. should be at we least one okay. or two not that i want that to happen no. but statistically it's gonna be hot it makes it makes sense at least it's not in july or august at least it's the end of september so maybe things will be cool i don't know i don't smart i, I haven't been yeah. on a i haven't been to that part of the world for a little while but uh yeah alabama i remember i pretty sure on that MXPX Value Pack 90 Pound Wuss Tour, I'm pretty sure we played in Birmingham. Yeah, sounds I'm right. I'm pretty sure that we did, and it was a little bit interesting, I think, if I remember correctly. <laughs> There's a lot of history in that town. Yeah. And it's a it's a interesting place. I think that that Chad was, at the time, like Slacker 66 or something like that. He had like a record store or a merch merchandise company and i think he might have even put on that show maybe probably like i think it was all kind of affiliated with something he was doing then but it's been so long i don't remember correctly so yeah. if i just said some bullshit that's not true don't pay attention to me <laughs> <laughs> well that tour um if it's the same tour I mean, we probably toured a couple times together but yeah i'm just trying to think there was a time and i, I want to say it was greenville north south carolina marty got hurt oh yeah he broke his arm or did he yep. just sprain his arm or wrist i don't know did, did he he might have got a concussion it was it a concussion but I think he sprained his shoulder and it was d- was it during the mxpx set the night before yeah he jumped off the stage and fell down and nobody caught him nobody caught him. what the heck dude <laughs> that happens <laughs> but 
I just remember that being like uh. the thing that sticks out because Yuri had to play drums for you guys the next night and did did not play quite as fast as Marty. Marty no. was insanely fast. Always was, mm -hmm. still is, I'm sure. I haven't seen him in a while. But We're, that's got to be pretty insane for Marty to try to play that fast nowadays. It's taken, uh, we've been practicing since January, at least every other weekend, if not sometimes every weekend. We had about three or four weeks off while somebody was in Europe and we all took mm -hmm. vacations around that time. But man, uh, he's pushing it. Like now, <laughs> I think some of those songs, we have to purposefully like let him slow down because I think a lot of those songs... You know, we were just playing fast because we wanted to play fast. They sound better and a little tighter if they're a few BPM lower. And they just do. And so we've. Been, it's great having Colin in the band because we're all, like, more the uh, sort of flighty, like, yeah, dude, that sounds great. Let's go. And, and he's like, nope, let's get the tempos down. Let's get these structures, make sure that, that, that there's no loose ends. And let's get, like, so he's very type A working things out in a, it's super good for us because we've never, ever, ever thought about tempo. Mm -hmm. And now we're thinking about it and, and actually mm -hmm. trying to, hey, this is where it sounds the best. This is where we're in the pocket and this is good. And so I think you'll, those who get to see us live this time around um, and are able to, I think that there will, if you saw us before, um, hopefully it'll be different enough and still memorable enough that it'll it'll hit all the good spots but um my hope is that you'll see that we've done the work to be tighter mm. than this band has ever been and um you know i've had to really stretch my vocals and figure out what actually works and what i can do and not sound stupid or corny because i can't scream like i used to for where I'm eager to die in particular and then my voice is you know I'm, I'm older and it tends to like get a little lower as you get older and more robust. And so there's certain parts that um, I don't know that I'll be doing any falsetto, but um, <laughs> yeah. there's one part in Torment and Tension where I'm trying to go just a couple lines that are like falsetto and they're in the slow part and they feel kind of good. So mm -hmm. depending on adrenaline and everything else, I may, but... The bigger thing is there's like the chorus of uh, nostalgia. We've had to do double vocals with somebody singing the octave I sing there and me doing it lower. Mm -hmm. And I've learned, you know, if you do if you go lower, it's not going to sound good unless you like figure out how to belt it yeah. lower. And so I've been able to like construct that and like figure out, okay, I just got to do it this way. And it ends up sounding more like nasally, kind of like almost like the pop punk style of singing that we did on the first record where I'm like, it's still growly, but it's not as uh, I'm not at the top of my lungs because that tends to break. And I, by the time we get it to the second time around, I'm like, oh, fuck. So, yeah. So there's things like that that will be different. Um, and I, I think it's just the way it's been 23 years. I, I am not you know, I haven't been doing this consistently. My voice has changed, you know, and when I was doing Suffering and the Hideous Thieves, it was I was singing a lot more. So there's my voice is and I did that longer than I did 90 pound wuss mm. put out more records wow. than 90 pound wuss put out. So, yeah. um, I, I, uh, have a tendency to be able to do what I did there a little bit better. So there's some sort of hybrid. It still sounds like us and it still sounds like me. The best part though is, um, the guitars, I think just like make it like, I'm so stoked. Like the way that they're John and Colin are interacting yeah. and playing on one another. It's really, really, really cool. That's cool. So that's cool. Um, that we got yeah. oh the keyboard that I used on shorthand operation, uh, I got one. It was broken. A friend of mine's fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> we did one rehearsal with it, and it worked great. And it sounded awesome on those songs, like really good. Like the the same vintage keyboard I had, same sounds, and then it broke again. So what kind of keyboard is that? It's a it's a Korg Poly sixty one. Okay, and so. I do have a backup. Don't recommend those break a lot. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't, don't, don't get, get, but get a move or something. Uh, yeah. So I do have a backup in case we don't get it fixed in two weeks for that show. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Which is, you know, a bunch of Ableton plugins and I'll just play a MIDI controller and have stuff. So we're using basically 
pretty much, like I said, r- songs from all three records. Um, I think that they really sound cohesive together in this lineup. And, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. There's a Furnace Fest uh, exclusive release of 500 copies coming out. We won't have it at the Bremerton show. It's not finished being pressed, but okay. we'll have it at Furnace Fest. It's a gatefold LP, but it's only one one record. But it's gatefold because there's so much art and content. There's two essays, one from Josh Porter of Showbread about 90 Pound Wheels because okay. we, were, we were one of his like most influential bands. Oh, rad. And then um, Matt Johnson writes an essay about us too in there and um, talks about volatility of and how dangerous we were and, and like stuff. You know, I, I, I hurt myself a lot in that band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, it's really cool. There's some artwork. I'm really excited for it. So Tooth and Nail will have 251 variant up on their website and then we'll have the other variant. So if you're a diehard fan, you can buy both. But um, mm-hmm. it's got songs from all three records. It's kind of a best of, and it shows how like all three records actually have a cohesive element of sing along, kind of more pop punk stuff. Yeah. Um, and then the other the B side is is more like uh, shows that there's on all three records there was this thread mm-hmm. of post-punk influenced experimental hardcore and i think that that's sort of what we gravitated to on the last record more Mm -hmm. um which is funny because it was like you know there was a lot of post-punk elements going on on that record and it was well before there was interpol and yeah yeah yeah's and that kind of stuff so it's interesting how uh that sort of came back around so hopefully I, i think i'm hoping that people will appreciate that aspect of us I know some people are really tied to that first record and um, I hope they're not disappointed because, you know, we want to make sure that they get their, their um, thing too, but we are playing from all three. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's nostalgia. Nostalgia is a heavy hitter when it comes to what you're fighting against yeah. for that first record. But uh, honestly, those all three of your records have that, what you're talking about, that thread of po- post punk, post rock, whatever it is. Something just a new sound that really started developing with John Spaulding and you and with the keyboard parts and stuff. And and it is a little different from your first record in general. But I hear some things on your first record. There's a couple of those songs you're talking about. Those could have been on those later records. And yeah. they would have been a different production. So the sounds would be different. Some of the guitar parts might have changed. But the the general vibe, like I, I buy it. I buy yeah. it for sure. Um, you know, John Spaulding was such an amazing artist and you know just being in the room with him you know it was different it was different you know and maybe that's why people like that have to pass early or something but it's just like it's so sad it's so heartbreaking but man the fact that you could you could come back what 23 years later or whatever since you've been playing and and be part of something like furnace fest with all these other bands playing that that's that's another big burst of of history and a burst of a new nostalgia. I don't know if that's not even a real term, new nostalgia, but like (laughs) you're going to make nostalgia for people this year when you play, they're going to, they're going to feel that from back in the day, but then they're going to get it in the future from, from that day. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty cool to, for, for Spalding, like to honor his sort of legacy and make those guitar parts. Like we literally both guitar players have an Ibanez pink analog delay pedal, and and Hamelberger is using two of them because he keeps one tuned. I mean, like Spalding, Set as one Spal- yeah, time. and Spalding would use it for so many effects, mm-hmm. and so and he'd twist it and do all sorts. He literally, he had his setup was weird. He had a, a you know Mesa boogie dual rectifier, and on the other side of the stage he had a Fender um, Super Reverb, and he. He'd have them on a dual switch where he could pan them back and forth, mm-hmm. or he could play through both of them at the same time, or just one. And then he had two pedals. He had an octave pedal and that Ibanez analog delay pedal. He didn't even have a fucking tuner. This was the this is the <laughs> thing why we were probably not very yeah. tight live is because he'd get out of tune and then he'd be out of tune so and he'd tune to himself. And so it wouldn't necessarily, you know, on the last tour he'd borrow the <laughs> yeah. the bass player's tuner. And Maurice was actually pointing this out to me. Um <laughs> recently i'm pretty sure it was maurice it might have been somebody else but maurice's uh 
basically our sixth member of 90 pound wuss he's he's documenting all that we're doing right now and we hope that there will be some video content for fans and stuff to see later but um the uh somebody and i think it was maurice pointed out to me the show there's a video of us playing at cornerstone on the last tour when the lineup was john spaulding me matt johnson on drums and our bass player was brian tremble who was in a band with spaulding when i met spaulding um called enlist and he was playing with us and he breaks a bass string and so he puts his bass string back on we're just kind of jamming and at the end, he starts to tune it, and he's looking for his tuner, and he has to go walk over to Spalding's amp and take it off. So not only was John borrowing Brian's tuner, he didn't even have it in his line right, row. He right. had it on top of his amp. It was the craziest thing. When we were in Raft of Dead Monkeys, yeah. that's the one thing Spal <clears throat> like Doug Lorig would always say, like, Dude, John, just get a fucking tuner, man. Like, just buy a damn tuner. You guys should have pulled, pulled your money together. Here, <laughs> he'd laugh and he'd always take. He just was adamant about. I don't know what it was. So these weird things that he'd latch on to mm -hmm. that made him so unique and interesting, yeah. and he'd get really good at a particular thing that nobody else was into, into at all. Like on tour, we'd tour and he'd listen to the Grateful Dead, like. None of us were listening. Yeah, like, I'm not into it. <laughs> I, I'd go, I, I was I was going bonkers. I'd like put earplugs yeah. in and stuff. I can't handle that shit. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I put earplugs <laughs> in just in case I might like it. Like I don't even want to know. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> it was so. I mean, there was there was always he, he's definitely a unique individual, and I miss him dearly. And I think for some reason because him and I had real um ways we wanted to do things and very creative ideas that we'd fight about it and then we'd come up with something totally outside of the box that neither one of us would have made and it, it made for i think a really so that last record shorthand when we wrote it M marty would show up from port angeles drive into town we were rehearsing at john's um friend's house in west seattle and they're like in their garage or basement room and we were writing songs and it was me and John writing songs. I was playing mm -hmm. bass on all the demos and everything, and I played bass on the recording of the record. So we were writing the songs as basically a, a two-piece, and then Marty would come in, and, and then it was would, would get solidified as a three-piece. Um, and uh, I think that that was one of the unique things that helped that record is John and I just like, hey, because we lived down the street from each other. We might have even lived... No, I think he was living with Jody at that time down the street in the U District. So we'd show up, and I have this idea. And then we'd just, like, jam it and then think, what if the drums did this or, like, whatever. Yeah. And then we'd go, Marty would show up, and we'd rehearse. I remember when we sent demos to Kravak, he was a... Uh, when he found out that the singer was going to be playing bass on the record, he was bombed. And he told me this. <laughs> and so it was it was interesting when we get in the studio and he was like, oh, this guy can actually fucking play. Like, he literally told me, like, I was so nervous about you playing the bass. Like, I'm like, the singer can't play bass in a band. He's not. He, and, and, like, that's the one thing I've noticed is that uh, trying to relearn a lot of these songs, Spalding and I had a really interesting dynamic rhythmically where we think a lot about we're doing, you know, a lot of... 4-4 four, four, but then suddenly there's like weird African type rhythms and like a, a lot of tr like triplets that aren't just like a fill at the end but they're like in staggered in the middle of things and weird right. rhythms that um, even trying to show everybody you know Matt and, and John we've had to kind of tweak things out because they don't think in the same terms that I, I was thinking with Spalding at mm -hmm. the time and revisiting that yeah. I'm remembering going oh yeah we only do this like we we did a lot of weird shit like we'll do like parts three times or two and a half and like weird stuff yeah. in this band that was way more mathematically complex than you'd think but it just felt right to us and mm -hmm. I, I don't I didn't remember that until we're listening to it again and yeah and Matt's like telling me why can't you guys just do things normal mm -hmm. I'm like I don't know man this is this I'm, is how we were thinking at the time I've told myself that many times it, it, relearning old songs being yeah. like why did we do this like Yuri will say that he'll be like. At the time, I didn't even play the right part. Honestly, this this is this is what I should have played. And yep. he'll like change it up a little bit and like do this. I'm like, yeah, you're right. It's technically better. Yep, so. we're doing some of that too. You do, yeah, you have to. Especially with the vocals, like yeah, the vocals, man. Like, there's no. They're 
actually like the dawning of this night divine which was one of the more popular songs from our our uh where meager die record um it's kind of awesome the chorus like i almost kind of have like a greg gaffin thing going on where it's got <laughs> nice. that monotone melodic thing yeah happening it's like and i think it sounds stellar better than just me yeah, 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 yeah. right it, it sounds it ends up sounding like i love that Add something to something these songs. new yeah. from, that you weren't expecting when you hear it live. Because when you hear something live, it doesn't sound like a record. It sounds different. So if you play exactly the parts from a record, you might not hear it the same. Well, you're not going to hear it the same yeah. way. It's going to be a mess of sounds, right? And so I feel like because of that, we always, not for every song, but like there's certain songs that just don't sound right the way we recorded it. So you just change it up. All right, four on the floor for that, Yuri. You know, hit that, you know, and then we'll go into it, whatever. That may not have been on the re original recording, but we do it for the audience, for ourselves, to mm -hmm. like get into the whatever the energy is for the song. So yeah, do, totally. continue doing that because it's going to make your show way better. We're also for the the Bremerton show. Yeah, you're going to get the best. Um, we get a, we're playing an hour, so we're playing longer than we've ever played as a band. Nice. We have a a, a lighting technician. We have a video that's being produced and there's a whole segment in the video that's like it's animations kind of moving around mm -hmm. of some of our new merch and some of the things that you might expect from 90 pound wuss it's pretty cool looking so far right what i've seen but there's a there's a an element in it where there's a john spaulding there's a john spaulding floating face that uh, changes and some other stuff so there's okay some, there's some tribute to him for sure and um i just think me personally it's gonna be the we're playing three shows so we're playing there, and then August 26th, we're playing at a place in Port Angeles that uh, a guy I used to skateboard with and went to high school with me and Marty. Mm -hmm. His name's uh, John Unruh. He owns a restaurant called Little Devil's Lunchbox that puts on shows. They've had, like, MDC play there. It's pretty fucking oh, right. rad. Okay. They've had some killer bands. And he's in a band called Acosta, and um, it's going to be a great show. August 26th, it's a Saturday. It's just us. And Calm Collapse, which is Doug Lord from Roadside Monument, it's okay. his new band, and they're kind of like a, you know, they 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 d d down tune and they've got some complicated riffage, but they're pretty they're pretty rock. Like a, they remind me a little bit of like Soundgarden or something. Okay, like it's, it's kind of cool. So they'll probably oh, play like cool. forty five minutes, right and, on. Then, and then we'll play. And so it's a smaller venue, like a hundred people can be there, but there is an opportunity if you're still in the Northwest. It'll be packed, and that one will sell out. I don't think the Bremerton show will sell out. I hope it does. I hope it but does. for us, We're, like, if there's a couple hundred people there, yeah. that'll be great. But I think the venue is, like, almost, like 350 plus. So sure. I think it's pretty big for us, in my opinion. But Where can people get tickets to that? Um, it's on Eventbrite. If you type in 90 Pound Wuss Bremerton, uh, it'll pop up okay. on Eventbrite. I, I think Do you guys have a website or a – I know you got a Wikipedia. Do we have but a website? I don't – Maybe a face you, Facebook you kind of use as your Linktree. Linktree. Yeah. So if you go to if that's you not go, a website, but I know what you no, mean. No, but it's it'll a, link. To, it'll just go everywhere. It'll link to the photos. Or, I'm so sorry, it linktree.com link slash ninety pound wuss. If you go to the Instagram in the bio, there's a link to the uh, ninety pound wuss link. Tree. Okay, go to our Instagram page, which is ninety pound wuss. You'll type it in. I think it's underscore after each one. But either way, go to. Look up 90 Pound Wuss on Instagram. Go to the link tree. There's links there. There will be there will yeah. be a website. Himmelberger and Marty are working on that, which will also have all of our new merch because we yes. have sweatshirts. We have multiple T-shirt designs. We have two different enamel pins. That's awesome. We have two different beanies. We have a patch, um, and we'll have a grip of stickers. So, um, right. We'll have new merch, and that will be available not just at the festivals afterwards. We don't know what the future holds right now. The The plan is let's reassess what we want to do after Furnace Fest. But there has been discussions about 2024 doing like four or five dates with Showbread. And, awesome. Um, they don't play very much so if that happens it'll be very special it'll be some west coast states probably portland seattle maybe spokane boise maybe yeah eugene or something i don't awesome. know but 
There's some discussion. We'll see. Not guaranteed, people. Not guaranteed so at all. Yeah. Furnace Fest is guaranteed. Bremerton yeah. is guaranteed. Port Angeles, Port Angeles yeah. is going to sell out, but it's guaranteed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing's really guaranteed, but you know what I mean. Yeah. As long as none of us die or get sick. Exactly. Like, yeah. we'll, <laughs> as long as we can make it there. That's what's so weird about being an artist that does events, shows, things that are scheduled in the future. Is like, I... I don't want to schedule much, you know, but I, I have these shows scheduled like half a year from now. Like I'm going to be in Birmingham on September 21st. Like, yeah, that's just weird to me. Right. You ever think about that? I know we're wrapping up, but <laughs> I just can't. Well, it's, it's mostly crazy that that's a thing because that hasn't been a thing for me for so long. So, yeah, now thinking like You're a back. year ahead is so friggin' weird. Like we mm -hmm. we got these calls in like about playing, I think it was in November or October of, you know, 2022. And by the time we made the decision and everything, by the end of the year, we're like, okay, we'll start practicing in January. But the show's in September mm -hmm. of 23. So it was already like almost a year away. And we like just knew, we were like, we haven't done this for so long. We better start practicing the very beginning of the year. And some of us, you know, uh, John Himmelberger has some, issues that have made his guitar playing a freaking miracle that he's doing it. And I am so stoked like to see yeah. how far he's progressed and the things that he's gone through to get to where he's playing these damn songs and he's playing them quickly and well, like I'm, I'm like, Oh crap, this is awesome. Good. Like, it's really cool to see that happening and see all of, I mean, you know, Marty's, I don't think he wanted to play fast music again. Like <laughs> He's like, I'll never have to do this again. Yeah. And, and, oh, and, what? You want to do Furnace Fest? Yeah, as 90-pound yeah. wuss? What? Oh, my gosh. Because <laughs> me and Marty, we tried to do uh, another band for a while. Um, and I was coming up there, and there was this uh, other person. Um, uh, Jeremy's his name. He actually lives in Port Orchard, but he was in Port Angeles at the time. And we knew him from back in the day and we were playing and we were kind of, we wrote some songs that kind of remind me of like joy division or something. So they're a lot more down tempo and slow. Um, and then we, uh, it just didn't, wasn't working out and he ended up moving to Port Orchard and whatever. But the, uh, Marty was into it and I was always like, let's try it. And then I got reluctant because my mentality for so long has been like, I just want to work and go home. I just want to work and go home. And it took mm -hmm. literally me committing to something a year out, knowing that it's going to happen yeah. and committing it to like get this part of my life back that that's like vibrant. And, you know, my kids are older. Like I, I'm my oldest I, has a kid herself. So I'm a grandpa now. Oh, and, wow. And um, Congrats. yeah, thanks, man. And my youngest is, you know, in middle school and my, uh, middle daughter just gr graduated high school and is going to college so there's a lot more you know they're more yeah. independent there's a lot more um ability for me to do stuff like this and yeah. and you know Teresa's really uh, my my partner she's really supportive um you know I uh, said yes to the marathon now you got to train for it yeah basically that's yeah. What's, what's going on and I love it and it's been good and it's the only way I get anything done yeah. because I, I will push it off to the last second but if I ha if I know I need to plan for something, then I'll do it. So, yep. Dude, Which thank is, you so yeah. much, man. This has been this has been fun. Yeah, I appreciate totally, it, man. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This Thanks is for coming. great. Yeah, it's been good. It's Can't wait it. to hang. Make sure your side stage, Furnace Fest Friday yes. night, because I want you to come out for a couple, at least some. You know, okay. give hit, away too hit much. Me up. You're, like some of the songs that you know, yeah, so that I can make sure that I know what. Yeah, of course, of course, I will. Yeah, I get it. Heck yeah! Like if you do small town minds or anything like yeah, that, it, yeah, hundred percent. Awesome. Uh, yeah, dude. Theme fiasco, maybe a little. We'll yeah, see. I, we'll see. Huh. Theme fiasco would be rad. That'd be dude. Dope. That's always been one of my favorite. It sounds like Black Flag. Like it sounds this. like basically ninety pound wuss, but yeah. like <laughs> like secondhand operation kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Maybe we were influenced by that. And I just didn't realize it. Maybe. I don't know. There's a black flag <laughs> element going on. Man. Well, I love black flag. Of course. Yeah. Dude, I just saw, I just, saw, I went to their, uh, the Greg Ginn, like black flag special with oh, Mike yeah. Valelli singing. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, it was stellar. They did My War all the way through. Rad. And then they took a 20 minute break and came back out and did basically all the freaking hits. It was mm. pretty rad. And Valelli. Uh, I I had heard that oh yeah he sucks and like all these other things but I think they're 
it's from Black Flag Purists or whatever. Right. Because when I saw it, man, he 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 decided like I'm gonna embody Rollins, and he did, man, and it was so good. That's it dope. was stellar. That's I awesome. was like listening to that. You know, I mean, My War is such a classic record. Yeah. I mean, the whole B side is what basically made like freaking like all this like Sabbath influenced uh, metal punk rock hybrid shit. It was fucking intense. the second side of Black yeah. Flag My War for sure. And, you know. I went and saw Rollins stellar. when he came to Seattle. It was years ago again, but he did a bunch of those songs. Oh, wow. It was rad. Yeah, nice. it was rad. Yeah, that's good. Cool. All right, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Jeff Bedker. Jeff Suffering. Yeah. <laughs> suffering. <laughs> awesome. We can you can make a caveat oh, or a yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, thing, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Oops. Well, if they show their if they show up Thursday, they're gonna miss Friday. Well, then they can go see Madball. Madball's yeah. playing on Thursday, dude. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I, I, we. we <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you listening. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Do all the things you got to do like that. And thank you to my guest, Jeff Suffering. 90 Pound Wuss is going to be playing in my town, Bremerton, right here in Bremerton. He was just here. Uh, he's going to be here Saturday 29th. Uh, sorry, Saturday, July 29th, right? That's a weekend. You guys can get off work. Just come on out. Do it. It's at the Redwood Movie House or, or the Redwood Theater, Tracy to Movie House. And... It's 90 pound wuss. They haven't played in 23 years. It's their first show back. It's going to be amazing. They're going to, there's going to have like movie, movie, moving pictures and things. Um, I'm looking forward to it. And then of course our good friends, the fibs, local boys from Bremerton going to be always awesome to see them. And I, I, I kind of love it when they don't close the show because then I can hang out with Sean a little more. And then uh, middle aged queers from California. So they're coming up. I think maybe they're on tour or something. Um, it's going to be awesome. So, Come on down. That's in a week. Uh, Furnace Fest, September 22, Friday night. It's going to be 90 Pound Wuss sometime during the day or, or evening. MXPX is closing out that night, headlining. Uh, we're playing with Hatebreed and Berlin, Reliant K. It's going to be insane. So that's Furnace Fest, Friday, September 22nd. All right. All right. Um, that's it. Of course, pre-order the new MXPX album. We got vinyl. We got all the T-shirts and all that. Uh, mxpx.com uh we appreciate you we love you and uh if you can't you don't feel bad if you can't afford to buy anything right now don't worry about it you know there'll be stuff we'll we'll print more stuff if we sell out or, or if we run out we'll print more don't worry just just the most important thing is enjoy the music listen to the music uh youtube is free we we have a bunch of live stream stuff like i said uh anyway please check out stay up all night add it to all of your places you listen to music, your library, your playlists, all of that, your your go-to-sleep music, your wake-up music, whatever. Uh, I appreciate you guys. All right, and go check out the YouTube. We got it on the video. It's great. Love it. All right. Uh, if you want to call in, the number is 830, sorry, area code 360-830-6660. Shout out to my boy Bob McKnight, producing, producer Bob, making it happen. Um, if you want to submit, you got to submit to the the Mike Herrera podcast Facebook group uh, for Music Mondays, all of that. Uh, Bob's going to curate that list. So uh, be nice to Bob. You know what I'm saying. All right. Peace out, everybody. Much love. Mm -hmm.